Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe believe. this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, today I want to talk to you about something that has a grip on much of America and much of the world. And what has a grip on much of America and much of the world is fear. And today we're going to talk about breaking the grip of fear in your life so that you don't have to be like the rest of the world. Now the Bible says, Jesus said, that we were in the world. Now you know you're in the world. You go to work and you work in the world. You go to school, you go to school in the world. But we are not, even though we are in the world, we are not of the world. We, we, have, we are of a different nation. Our citizenship is in heaven. This world is not our home. As the man said a hundred years ago that wrote the song, he said, which by the way, he was from the Ozarks, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. So the reality is, the world, in the world, there is fear. In the house of God, there is faith. Now, if you've gone to this church any time at all, you know the reality that there is a difference between faith and fear. They are both spiritual substances. Fear is the substance that the enemy uses in the realm of the spirit to get you away from the things of God and to bring destruction in your life. John 10.10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He does this through his words of fear and you believing them. That's, That's how he can get you destroyed. But faith is the opposite. Faith is believing God. The word faith in the New Testament, the Greek word, without giving a New Testament Greek lesson, just trust me on this. The the word for faith in the New Testament, in Koine Greek, is the exact same word for trust. So when we say have faith in God, in, in Mark 11, 22, when Jesus said have faith in God, He could have said it this way, trust God. Trust his word. Believe what he says. So we need to understand that uh, faith, trusting God, is what's going to bring the goodness in our life. And having fear will bring the badness in our life. Let, Let me show you something. Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, did a, in their medical department, in their medical school, they came up with this conclusion, that chronic fear, chronic fear will do these four things. First, here's how it affects you physically. Fear weakens your immune system and can cause cardiovascular damage. Gastrointestinal problems such as ulcers and irritable bowel syndrome and decreased fertility. It can lead to accelerated aging and even premature death. That's what fear, chronic fear, can do physically. Here's what chronic fear can do The second thing is to your memory. Fear can impair formation of long-term memories and cause damage to certain parts of the brain. Then they go on to use medical terms. This can even make it more difficult to regulate fear and can leave a person anxious most of the time. To someone in chronic fear, the world looks scary. And their memories are altered to confirm that. The third way chronic fear affects you is in your brain processing and your reactivity to things. It says fear can interrupt the process in our brains that allow us to regulate emotions, to read nonverbal clues, and other information presented to us. Hmm. This 
impacts our thinking and our decision-making in negative ways, leaving us susceptible to intense emotions and impulsive reactions. All of these effects can leave a person in chronic fear to act inappropriately. And the last thing was mental health. Chronic fear developing into long-term fear causes fatigue, clinical depression, and PTSD. Now, isn't that interesting? See, that's what fear can do to you in the natural. But it results of what you believe in the spiritual. As Christians, knowing the truth is the only thing that sets us free. We must walk in faith. We must trust God and trust his promises. We've got to believe that what he told us is true. If his word says the children of the righteous will be delivered, fear will tell you that's not true. Fear will tell you, well, you're the exception to the rule, not my kid. Faith tells you God doesn't lie. And you've got to believe and speak what God says. If you don't, then you're going to end up believing the negative report and you're going to get what the devil says. And what is the devil saying? The devil's saying, your child's a loser. Your child will never be anything. And what the devil knows is that his words have no power whatsoever until you say them. Because you are a speaking spirit. And you have been given authority. The devil doesn't have authority. You have authority. His words mean nothing until you say them. And when you say them, you're a speaking spirit given the authority by God to rule and reign on this earth. Wow. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 10.3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means they're not fleshly. But mighty in God for the pulling down strongholds. If you have a stronghold in your life you need pulled down, let me tell you something. Natural ways of dealing with it puts a Band-Aid on it. Spiritual ways of dealing with it solves the problem. When I was at the hospital about a year ago and they told me there was no hope for me, in fact, the doctor looked at me and they said, we can't even use the word cure. Well, that was in the physical. But I set the physical aside and I went to the spiritual. And now I have in the spiritual cure. And then that falls over into the physical. See, what, ha what takes place in the realm of the spirit is what affects what takes place in the realm of the physical. Right? 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds might be may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. I want to take a look at the first part of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Satan is a deceiver. And you must realize that. He's going to take what's wrong and make it look right. He's going to take a lie and make it look like the truth. Why? He's trying to trick you the same way he tricked Eve. When he said, well, didn't God say? And, and he starts reasoning with you. Let me tell you something. You can't negotiate and you can't reason with the devil. He's a fool. He's an idiot. You know, I said that one time many, many years ago, and Loretta said, you're not supposed to call people idiots. I'm not calling a people an idiot. I'm calling the devil an idiot. The Bible says, say what God says. God says the devil's an idiot. He's, he's, he's not right. Thank you for your enthusiasm on that. 
2 Timothy 1.7, one of my favorite scriptures, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Now, isn't that powerful? See, fear doesn't come from God. You've you got to look at where something's coming from. The world is based on fear. The news you listen to every night, it doesn't matter if you listen to MSDNC or if you listen to Fox or whatever, or CNN, it, it doesn't, it's all negative. Even the good news is negative. It's presented in a negative way. They don't tell you about a town where everything's going normal. No, they tell you where the, a town where there's a disaster. And if you continually fill yourself with the negativity of the world, one of the worst things you can do is just be a newsaholic. Because the news is not coming from God, it's coming from the world. Now, that doesn't mean you shut yourself up and, and you just don't have a clue what's going on. No, no, you've got to use wisdom and you need to know what's going on and you need to make your vote count. You, you need to be involved in politics, which, by the way, the, the bill we had been working for uh, pertaining to Israel, it passed the Senate this week. Uh, kudos to, to Gwen Payne and all of our crew that went up there. But let me tell you something. We're, we're involved in politics, but we don't get in, involved in politics where all we do is just spew out negativity about the other side. I mean, they know they're wrong. <laughs> all right. 2 Corinthians 4.13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore speak. Speak what? We say what God says. You know, I, I even listen to some Christian prophecy channels, and, and, and a lot of them are very good. But I was listening to a guy the other day, and all he could talk about was the mark of the beast. Well, it's okay to know about the mark of the beast, but the way he was teaching it was like, you better be careful. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to be here during the tribulation, you know. You can't scare me with, with tribulation stuff because I'm not going to be here. And it's nice to know what's going to happen. I even teach on what's going to happen. But I don't worry about what's going to happen because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And before all that happens, the trumpet's going to toot, we're going to shoot, we're out of here. <laughs> all right. Fear starts <clears throat> by hearing a bad report. That's where fear starts. You go to the doctor, the doctor says, uh, you're going to die. Well, okay, hello. That's where you have an opportunity. You listen to that bad report, and if you bring it in, you'll have fear. But what you need to do is to say what God says. That doesn't mean that you ignore circumstances around you. See, some people get weird with some of this stuff. If you say, uh, say what God says instead of what the doctor says, then some people interpret that, well, I, I'm just never going to go to the doctor again. I don't need doctor. No, look, there's, you need to take care of yourself. And God has given medical people wisdom and knowledge and understanding it's growing it's growing we know more now than what we knew when the united states was just forming one of our presidents after he was president in his later years he died because the doctors put mercury into his veins because they thought that was the cure of the day well now we know that doesn't work <laughs> you know that's kind of like death itself <clears throat> so uh, we know more, and we, we, can, we can rely on some of these things, but you don't rely solely on those things, and you always seek God for wisdom. And the more you hear the bad report, the greater the fear gets a grip on you, and then the next thing you know, you start saying the negative words that they're saying. Fear breaks you down. Never forget this. Fear breaks you down physically. It breaks you down mentally. It breaks you down spiritually. It'll break you down socially. You'll find that the more negative you become in life, the fewer friends you will have. 
2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What is the truth? The truth's in the word of God. And you've got to rightly divide it. Don't take scriptures out of context to try to prove a point. Just be like a child and just believe what God says. With little children, it's so great. You say, stand up on this table. And I, Many years ago, I, in fact, I wrote an article about this. It was so cool. This, this father, I saw this father put his little kid up on the edge of a table. And he says, come here. And the kid just kind of leaned over and the father caught him. The father backed up a couple steps and he says, come here. And the kid just leaned over and the father stepped up and caught him. And the father turned to walk away. And the kid on the table. <laughs> and somebody said something, the father turned around and caught him. But see, that kid had so much faith that his dad was going to catch him, that his dad caught him every time, that it didn't even matter if his dad's back was turned and he was walking away. He didn't go by the way things looked. He just knew if he falls over, his dad's going to catch him. We need to be that way with our father just to know that no matter what we're falling into, his arms are there to get us. He is our deliverer. Take the whole word and rightly divide it. And don't try to copy what people say. See, too many people make judgments on what somebody else says. I've had people come to me and they say, well, boy, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And I said, how do you know that's happening? Well, so-and-so told me. Well, you go to so-and-so and they say, well, you know, I heard somebody else say it when I was standing in the line down at Walmart. Yeah, and next thing you know, somebody made it up. It, it really doesn't matter. You, you, you have to check everything out that you believe with the Word of God. <clears throat> One of the biggest hindrances to healing and afflictions is not discerning the lies of the devil. One of the biggest hindrances to financial success is listening to the flesh and not discerning the lies of the devil. I mean, I remember many years ago when this guy took Loretta and I out to Olney, Illinois, and he was in a stretch limo, and he was wearing a white suit, and he had white gloves. And he took us out to an oil well that had just been drilled. And surprisingly, it became a gusher while we were in the car. And so he got out, and he walked over with his white gloves, and he reached down and he picked up some of that oil that was coming out. And he comes back to the car and he looks at me and he goes, black gold. Well, I mortgaged my car to invest in that oil well. And a few months later, I was walking. So, you know, and then when I went to try to find this guy, he was nowhere to be found. And then to top it off, that was my Camaro, Robbie. That was the Camaro I had. And to top it off, my sister went to the bank and bought my car. <clears throat> Every time I saw her driving around in my red Camaro, okay, we won't go there. She's in heaven looking down at me right now. You don't have the Camaro now. <laughs> okay. Uh. All right. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know who he's going to devour? The easiest ones to devour. He's, he's no different than the, than the lions and tigers in Africa that are chasing after the herd. They chase after the herd, and then someone strays away from the herd. One animal gets out there by itself, and there you are. You're the target. That's why we need each other. That's why the Scripture says, forsake not the assembling together of yourselves. And even the people who aren't here that are watching online who are a part of this group, uh, that, that doesn't necessarily mean just physically together, but that means we, we bond ourselves together with our faith. We, we know who we are and we know whose we are. And there's strength in staying together. And, and that's why so many times in a church, you know, I've been around this thing enough years that I know. I've seen people, I've seen people that I've won to the Lord 30 35 years ago, 
and everything's going good for a while. And then they get a little ticked off at somebody in the church. Not necessarily this church, just some church, any church, whatever. They just get, they just get a little upset because somebody sat in their seat, somebody didn't eat their casserole, somebody parked in their parking spot, somebody didn't shake their hand properly, you know, whatever. They got upset over something and they separated themselves and before long, before long, the devil came along like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, and he saw them separated, and they become easy prey. That's why we need to have godly friendships. So in times of trouble, you can call somebody that actually knows Jesus and doesn't give you some harebrained advice. You know, I had a guy in my office one time, and he did something really super stupid. Why is everybody looking around trying to figure out who it is? <clears throat> did something really stupid. And I said, why did you do that? What, whatever possessed you to do that? He said, well, and he named off the bar down here at the lake. He said, I was down there just sitting there, minding my own business, drinking a beer, just late at night. And I, he said, I was kind of looking sad, and I saw some guy I went to high school with, and he came over, and next thing you know, we got all drunked up, but he gave me some advice, and I said, how'd that work out for you? So you got to watch where you get your advice. <laughs> All right. Psalm 53, 2. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. God's looking for people that will just believe him. He'll, he'll pass over a million people to find one person, and you don't have to be a famous preacher. You can be anybody. He's looking for somebody that will just stand up and say, I believe you. And he'll work miracles in that person's life. Listen to this. Psalm 1-1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. See that thing? And whatever he does will prosper. Well, who is this guy? Well, you go back up to the beginning of that, and there's three things about this guy you need to know. Number one, he doesn't seek counsel from the ungodly. <laughs> if you want counsel... Find the most spiritual person in the church that you can find or somebody that actually reads their Bible and comes to church, all right? And you don't, look, and just ask them, what's your opinion on this? And then judge it by the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Holy Spirit. But get counsel from godly people. I said get counsel from godly people. I had a person come to me one time. They'd been divorced, I think, either five or six times. And uh, they wanted to become the marriage counselor in the church. And I said, well, what <coughs> this is true. I said, what qualifies you for this? They said, well, I've got a lot of experience. <laughs> no, we want people, look, you want to find out how to, how to work things in a marriage? Find somebody Find some old codger that's been married 60 years and say, how'd you make it? And you might be surprised at the godly wisdom you'll get. <laughs> I tell you what, you can't get ticked off at every little thing that happens in life. There's a lot of little things happen. And they only become big if you dwell on them. Number one, this man says, don't seek the counsel of the ungodly. Number two, it says, don't walk with sinners. He doesn't walk with sinners. What does that mean? Well, that doesn't mean, in context, it doesn't mean that you don't know sinners. It doesn't mean you don't talk to sinners. It doesn't mean you don't witness to sinners. But here's the whole thing. If a whole bunch of people are hanging out together and they're all ungodly people, don't put yourself right in the middle of them and stay there. You can put yourself in the middle of them and preach, and he'll probably kick you out. Maybe not. But don't just get in the middle of them and stay there, which takes me to missionary dating. 
Anybody know what missionary dating is? You have no idea how many girls have come to me over the years. I mean, dozens who said, I said, well, is he a Christian? And they go, no, he's not. But if I marry him, listen, it's a whole other sermon. <laughs> and it says, and don't be a scornful person. Did you see that? It says, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. You know what scornful is? I wasn't really sure what it was. So this week, I looked it up in the dictionary. Amos, you're going to love this. Here's what a scornful person is. Not that you're scornful. I didn't, <laughs> but, you know, now that you'll know as much as I know about scornful. <clears throat> a scornful person is a person who mocks, who scoffs, who sneers. They're snide. They're disparaging. They're dismissive. Now, this is right out of the dictionary. They're snotty. They're snarky. I like that one. See, you say, well, <clears throat> I'm not that way. I only say good things. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, you know Steve back here? Steve, bless God, is a wonderful man. Okay, so you're talking to somebody, you go, Steve, bless God, he's a wonderful man. <laughs> Your body talks. That's why they call it body language. So it's not just the words you say, it's how you say them. And you can be a person that says the right words, but you can be snarky when you say them. The Bible says, don't. Don't be that way. And if, don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Wow. Well, God gave us a plan. And he also told us the plan of the enemy so that we can be ahead of him. See, in, uh, in World War II, one of the ways we won the war was we had intelligence that found out what the enemy was going to do. And if you know how the, you know, Paul put it this way. He said, brethren, talking to the church, he said, I do not want you to be ignorant of the enemy's devices. Why? If you know how the devil attacks, then that gives you a heads up so you can stop it. If you know that the enemy attacks you with lies, then you're going to examine everything that's said to see if it's true or not. Right? Right? Faith and fear are opposites. Faith does not exist in fear, and fear does not exist in faith. <clears throat> now, I've given this illustration many, many times, but it's important. In an airplane, in my airplane, I sold it, but in my airplane, there was a gauge that had rate of ascent and rate of descent. This gauge told me how fast I was going up or this gauge told me how fast I was going down. There was only one gauge needed. I didn't have two gauges, one that told me how fast I was going up, one told me how fast I was going down. It's all in one gauge. Why? Because you can only be doing one of those at a time. You can't be going up and down at the same time, so you just need one gauge. That's because up and down are opposites. In the Hebrew language, you need to understand this, faith and fear are opposites. You cannot be doing both at the same time. You're either trusting God or you're not. Are you following me? There is no middle ground. There's a kingdom of light. There's a kingdom of darkness. There is no kingdom of gray. So you may be saying, for example, this is north. <clears throat> I, I am saying I am facing north. So that means I'm telling the truth and I am facing north. But I could be deceived and turn this way and say I'm facing north, but I'm not. 
If the enemy can get me to believe that what I'm saying is true, if he can get me to believe that I think I'm actually facing north, but I'm actually facing south, and I build all of my trust on the lie, the end is destruction. <clears throat> Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, he said it's the truth, it's knowing the truth that sets you free. It's not what you say, it's what you say that's true that overpowers the enemy. And that one thing right there should be powerful for everyone. It is impossible for faith and fear to coexist. You may say, well, I've been standing in faith, but I've just been anxious. No, no. If, if you're truly anxious, you're not totally in faith. The Bible says be anxious for nothing. Why? Because anxiousness is a byproduct of fear. Worry, worry. Now listen to me. Worry is a byproduct of fear. I've had people in my family before, not my immediate family, but some of my other family, my mom, when I was growing up, I mean, it was like, if you didn't worry, you didn't care. She said, I'm worried about you, son. And she had a right to be. <laughs> I was strange. But she said, I'm worried about you. But even when things were going right, she still had that same worrisome attitude. Because in her culture growing up, where she grew up in her family, if you really cared about somebody, you worried about them. That's a lie of the enemy. If you really love somebody, you'll have faith in them. You will trust them. Remember, faith and trust are the same thing. True love trusts. Okay. Fear promotes hatred. Faith promotes love. Fear promotes greed. Faith promotes generosity. Fear promotes stress and striving. Faith promotes peace. Fear promotes worry. Faith promotes rest. Fear brings on sadness and depression. Faith brings on joy and laughter. The Bible says that God smiles at his enemies. You should try that sometime. Fear seeks its own agenda. Faith lets go and doesn't press. Yeah, when, when the enemy comes at you, if you have nothing to fear, if you know that greater is he who is in you than he who is coming against you, if you know that, if you know that you have been given authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you, if you know that and you know it, you know it, you know it, deep down inside, then when, when something comes against you, you just kind of feel like David when he was up against Goliath. You know, you may be big, but you're just going to hit the ground harder when you fall. Nothing is going to scare you. Now, don't get that confused. Here's, here's a problem. You can take what a preacher says and take it to an extreme. Like when I say don't be in fear, that doesn't mean that you're not going to jump when you get out of your car and you almost step on a snake in your driveway. I'm not talking about, as they say here in the Ozarks, being a scared of something. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about the, the fear of failure, the fear of defeat, the fear that grips you when you see that there's no way out. God makes a way when there is no way. I don't have time for all the illustrations right now, but I, but I, can, I can attest. I have been in, in physical situations where they said there was no way out. I have been in financial situations where they said there was no way out. I was one time in my life, I was in a situation. I told Loretta, I said, if I win the lottery, if I win a million dollars, it's not going to affect the situation I'm in right now. It'll just be a million more dollars that they're going to come and take. I couldn't see any way out. But God made a way. I'll never forget the night we were laying there in bed, and, and 
I looked over at Loretta and I said, you know what? Because I had been stressing. I had been stressing. I had internal bleeding. I was, I was stressed over this. And, not, and I had kept it from all my friends. Nobody knew it. Everybody thought I was just sailing high. I mean, I got airplane in the hangar and I got boats in the yard and acres of property on the water and everybody thought, wow. But deep down inside, I'd, we'd have a Bible study at our house and everything was fine, and people would leave, and lives would get changed. But what they didn't know is when they went out the driveway and left, I couldn't sleep that night. I mean, the stress was just overpowering. But I'll never forget that night. I looked at Loretta, and I said, you know what? We either believe God or we don't. If we lose it all, he gave it to me once. He can give it to me again. And if he doesn't, so what? So what? And I rolled over and slept like a baby and wrote the book, God's Plan for Handling Stress. Because I tell you, his plan for handling stress is give it up. Turn toward faith. If you look on the front of that book, it says God's plan for handling stress. But if you turn it sideways and you look at that granite wall, embedded in that granite wall is kind of a, an elusive faith. Faith is the answer. Trusting God is the answer to all your stress problems. All right. <clears throat> well, I'm ready for my sermon now. So I'm just going to give it to you real quick. You probably don't even have time to write this down, but here's what I'll do. Anyone who wants my notes today, and, and they're pretty good notes today. Anyone who wants my notes today, uh, just email us here at the office and say that you want the notes titled, Breaking the Grip of Fear, and we'll email them to you for $9.95. Uh, <clears throat> no, totally free, 100% free, 100% free. Okay, I'm going to give you quickly... In just the next two or three minutes, I'm going to give you quickly five ways to break the grip of fear. Number one, saturate yourself with the Word and solid Bible teachings. Find some preacher that you like. You know what? There's a lot of good preachers out there that are teaching the Word, but some of them I like to listen to and some of them I don't. One guy I don't like to listen to just because he's got a nasal twang. I mean, he, he preaches good, <laughs> yeah, but find somebody that you like. There's a lot of good, solid Bible preachers out there. And get their CDs or download their stuff and, and just listen to it in your car as you drive. Listen to it as you go to sleep. Saturate yourself with the Word. Proverbs 1.33 says, But whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without fear of evil. Isn't that good? Number two, walk in love. Boy, that's a big one. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Isn't that interesting? It goes on, talks more about it. Walking in love. That doesn't mean you've got to be mushy with everybody, but come on. You know what I'm talking about. Walking in love. That means getting over some of the irritations. It doesn't mean you've got to be pals with idiots, but it means you've got to love them. No, seriously. It doesn't mean you've got to hang around with people that don't ever take a shower. I mean, you know, we had this guy, not at this church, but a previous church we went to, we had this guy that, true story, he believed that bathing in garlic was the only way to bathe. He didn't want water to touch his skin. And we had him over to our house one night, him and his wife. I'll tell you later who it was, Robbie. <laughs> we had him and his wife over to our house, and I'm telling you, all joking aside, we practically had to fumigate the house. Garlic on a human in small doses is okay. And garlic's good for you. It's okay. Boy, I'll tell you what. But, but you know what? I didn't like being around that guy. But I loved him. You know what I'm saying? Really, he was a good guy. He just had one bad quality. Garlic. Whew. All right. Number four. Or excuse me, number three. Guard your words. You know what that means. 
Watch what you say. You want to get, a, get rid of the grip that fear has on your life? Watch what you say. It'll change some things. Number four, develop a lifestyle of faith. In other words, develop a lifestyle of trust. Quit being so negative. Don't, don't have the first thing you go to when somebody tells you something. Well, I'm sure that's not true. I can't believe that. Now, it may not be true, but receive it, check it out, judge it, and then if it's not true, reject it. But don't be that person that's just negative on everything. Have you ever sat in a business meeting and it doesn't matter what idea came up? You got this one person that says, that'll never work. I tried that nine years ago. That'll never work. I was at another place and we tried that. That'll never work, you know. A lifestyle of faith, trust. And number five, this is the last thing. Let peace rule your life. Boy, it is, it is so nice to just be at peace, to be at rest. I'll give you a couple of scriptures and we'll close here. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. What's that mean? That means quit looking at what everybody else has and complaining that you don't have what they have. No, be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You have the Lord. I mean, how much more do you need? You have the one who created the universe living inside of you. Verse 6. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. Look at that next phrase. What can man do to me? Hey, Ryan, what can you do to me? What can anybody do to you? I mean, if somebody walks up to you and threatens to kill you, do you, do you grasp this? It's... It's very difficult to threaten a Christian with death. This minister a few years ago said he was in a lunchroom and somebody overheard him uh, talking about Jesus and they pulled out a 38 revolver and walked up and he said, they stuck it in my navel. And they said, shut up or I'm going to shoot you. He says, man, he said, I smiled at him. I looked and said, man, you're just giving me a one-way ticket home. You know, we, we need to understand that nothing, you, you can't threaten us with death because our death is in our past. All right, last scripture. <clears throat> Proverbs 3.25. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor trouble from the wicked when it comes. Proverbs 3.25. Verse 26. <clears throat> For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. <clears throat> well, I like that. Do not be afraid of sudden terror. <clears throat> Nor trouble from the wicked when it comes. The world wants you to be afraid of sudden terror. But no weapon formed against me will prosper. Does that mean that we don't do safety measures? No, we do safety measures. What about people who are going to the extreme with safety measures? Well, that's fine. That's them. That's not you. Quit judging somebody else. It's just kind of like when, when the virus was a big deal. Uh, and I speak of it in the past tense. But when the virus was a big deal, and even today, some people wear masks, some people don't. If God's told you not to wear one, fine, don't wear one. But don't be pointing your finger at somebody that does. Our job is not to judge. Our job is to walk in faith and to walk without fear. All right, did you learn anything today? How to get rid of, how to break the grip of fear. Fear is a bad thing. I've been there. And there is no fun in fear. 
You know, one verse we read earlier, it says, fear involves torment. Perfect love casts out fear, but fear involves torment. And people who walk in negativity and fear, they're, the reason they're not fun to be around is because they are tormented. And it's no fun to be the tormented person. And once, once you can get a grip on the fact that the one who created the universe has got your back, and he'll take care of your enemies, you say, but so-and-so did this to me. Well, God will take care of so-and-so. Your job is not to take care of them. Your job is to take care of you. All right? I said, all right? Do you agree? All right, stand up. We'll make our closing confession. Fear, I speak to you in the name of Jesus. And by the power and the authority that I've been given, spirit of fear, I rebuke you, leave now in the name of Jesus. All right. God bless you all.